Greetings and salutations. Today we will be covering the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. As a child, spending time with friends and hearing a good scary story is something many of us have experienced. Whether they be memories of telling scary stories themselves, or watching a scary movie, going to a haunted house, amongst other things. There is a shared camaraderie developed when you and your friends hear a terrible tale. However, regardless of how frightening the stories about demons, ghouls, killers, monsters stalking us in the dark, or even haunted houses filled with frightful fiends, none of us really believed they were real or could affect us in any real way, or that there was any form of danger attached to these stories. However, not everyone can be so fortunate. For a trio of girls in 1977, the campfire tale of a killer in the woods stalking them would become a frightful reality. This is the story of one of, if not the single most dreadful cold case in the history of Oklahoma. The year was 1977. At around June, kids from all over the state would be heading out to a series of different camps. One of these camps would be Camp Scott, a Girl Scout camp near Locust Grove, Oklahoma. This was considered one of the best run organizations in the state, which served girls in 39 western Oklahoma counties. Said camp had been celebrating an anniversary recently. The camp itself was just over 30 miles from the city of Tulsa and sat on a total of 410 acres of land. Now to prepare for the new campers, the counselors and the counselors in training held a training session. This was to ensure they were ready to keep all the campers that would be coming for their week-long camping trip safe. During this training, a counselor at Camp Scott had brought a box of donuts to share with the other counselors. She would go on to discover that her belongings had been ransacked and the donuts had been pilfered. However, inside the empty box was a rather sinister handwritten note. Written in all capital letters was the message, we are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one. Seeing this vile note, she took it to the director of the camp. However, the director along with the girls other supervisors treated the note as a prank and it was discarded. Choosing to pay it no mind, they would continue on as if nothing had happened. It was Sunday, June 12th, when the first buses chocked full of Girl Scouts would arrive at Camp Scott. If the pictures of the preceding goodbyes are anything to go by, the spirits of all those involved were rather high and filled with joy. However, ominously enough, the weather was anything but joyous. It was foggy, rainy, and rather muggy overall. After their arrival, the girls would be split by age and assigned to their housing for the duration of the camping trip. Said accommodations would house anywhere between four to six girls. On average, the camp would host a series of activities ranging from archery, swimming, bonfires, telling scary stories, eating s'mores, essentially things that would strengthen the bonds of friendship between the girls. However, on the first night, the weather would not permit the girls to partake in any of the planned fun or entertainment. A sudden thunderstorm forced everybody to run back to their cabins, where they would be safe, or at least that's what they believed. And while they were safe from the storms, they would not be safe from the threat hiding in the shadows, from the very same monster that had been stalking them. Now it must be noted that the campsite was set up in a horseshoe pattern and had a common area at the center, while the camp counselor's cabins would be relatively close to the common area and the other cabins would be spread in a similar scheme. This particular camp had a singular extra cabin. This cabin would be the cabin that the victims would reside in and its placement was significantly closer to the tree line, meaning that with the added factors of the heavy rain and darkness, it would be made significantly more difficult for anyone to see into the tent from their own positions. The last anyone saw of the girls was around 7 p.m. on Sunday, June 12th, 1977, when the girls were huddled in their tents, waiting for the storm to pass. June 13th, 1977, 
sometime between 2 and 4 a.m. One or more individuals came into the camp, then proceeded to kill and violate the three girls who were sleeping in the most far off cabin. The perpetrator and killer would go on to carry the bodies to a location somewhere around 150 yards from their accommodations. At 6 a.m., Camp Counselor Clara would discover three bodies on the side of the trail while she was on her way to the showers. This was just outside the tent area. Then it would be discovered that three of the girls from one of the tents was missing. This would cause the counselors to scour the area, leading them to discover that all the missing girls had been murdered. Now, two of the bodies were discovered being inside sleeping bags that were zipped up all the way to the top, explaining why they would not automatically ID the girls. They had been left on the trails. When they unzipped all three of the bags, they would note that the girls that were inside were Michelle Geese, Doris Minner, and Lori Farmer ages 8, 9, and 10. They would also discover that they had been bludgeoned with something large, particularly a red flashlight, which was found on top of the girls' bodies. Later on, they would also discover that they had been strangled. The subhuman monster who had taken their lives had done other things to them. Let's just say their innocence was violated, and leave it at that. By 7.30 a.m., several members of local law enforcement were present at the crime scene, and the official investigation would begin at approximately 10 a.m. Camp Scott was evacuated. This was without telling the other campers why they were heading back home after one night at camp. Charter buses would take the girls to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they would meet with their families. Sadly, three families would be completely unprepared for the fate that befell their daughters. When they had dropped off the girls for what was supposed to be a fun week, they would never have expected their excursion to end this way. Detection dogs or sniffer dogs would immediately be brought in to track down any and every last shred of evidence they could find. And indeed, they found some evidence. Specifically, a footprint from a men's nine and a half shoe, which was found in the blood of the victims. Authorities were also able to find a singular fingerprint on the lens of the flashlight that was used to bludgeon the girls. To this day, the fingerprint remains unidentified, along with a piece of cord and some duct tape that were also eventually found and classified as evidence. There was also a local landowner who had reported hearing quite a bit of traffic in the remote road which lied between the camp and his property sometime between the hours of 2.30 and 3 a.m. On June 13th, authorities would quickly begin to look for suspects. A man was arrested seven miles north of Camp Scott. He was living in his car. However, he was just questioned by police and then released, essentially being cleared. The investigation would eventually focus on a ranch just west of Camp Scott, owned by Jack Schroff. Schroff had items stolen from his cabin, which may have had a connection to the murders. Authorities would then go on to focus on a man by the name of Jean Lerot Hart, who was mentioned as a possible suspect rather early into the investigation. Hart had escaped from Mays County Jail four years before the murders and had been loose ever since. He was a veritable menace lurking in the shadows. It must be noted that his family lived just one mile from the camp where the grisly murders took place. This could imply that he would have had a rather intimate knowledge of the area, making it possible that he would be able to sneak into the camp, commit his vile acts upon the girls, and leave without ever being noticed. At some point between June 16th and 18th, it was rumored that a local Cherokee man had placed a curse on the tracking dogs, saying that they would all die soon. Later, on the 18th of June, one of the tracking dogs would go on to die from heat exhaustion. Later, another one 
of the two remaining searching dogs would, without explanation, run into heavy traffic only to be struck and killed by a car. On June 22, 1977, authorities would announce that two photographs had been found with three women pictured in them. There is a discrepancy where some officials would go on to tell the press that the photos were found near the girls' bodies, while other officials told the press that the photos had been found in a cave about two miles from Camp Scott. Later, Sid Wise would announce a media blackout because he felt that the press was portraying the investigators as being involved in infighting. On this day, forensic experts would go on to say that there had been only one good fingerprint on one of the bodies and that the other prints were all smudged. The good fingerprint was quote unquote a perfect print according to one source. Officials would later disclose that two photographs were developed by Hart while he was working in a photo lab at Granite Reformatory. On June 27, 1977, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, also known as the FBI, sent 40 agents into the area to help with the investigation. Later, after the FBI arrived on June 30th, 1977, Hart's mother, Ella May Buckskin, would go on to tell the press that she was regularly being harassed by Sheriff Waver and that authorities had planted that photograph to be found in an attempt to implicate her son. According to Miss Buckskin, Waver was doing this because of growing pressure to have a suspect. The FBI would go on to make claims that they had information and proof that Hart was in the area during the murders. On June 21st, 1977, Oklahoma Governor David Boren would offer the help of the National Guard in the manhunt. There would also be another suspect added to the list by law enforcement. They would only go so far as to identify him as Mike. He was apparently camping alone near Camp Scott. He was also believed to have stolen a hatchet from a nearby Boy Scout camp. On October 1st, 1977, there would be a $5,000 reward offered for any information leading to the arrest of Hart. This reward was made available by a group of residents calling themselves Drug Awareness. At 4.15 p.m. April 6th, 1978, a team of eight agents, including Mike Wilkerson, Harvey Pratt, Jack Lay, and Larry Bowles, Bud Olson, Carrie Thurman, Don Sharp, and Roger Crisco, would storm a home in the remote area of the southeast corner of Cherokee County, near Bunch, Oklahoma. The residence belonged to a man named Sam Pigeon and was located about 45 miles from Camp Scott. Hart was arrested in the home without incident. From here, Hart would be transported directly to Oklahoma State Penitentiary at McAllister. While the trial went on, the sheriff would go on to state that he was certain that Hart would be found guilty. However, despite how sure the authorities were, things did not seem to add up. One of the incongruities was that the, the footprint would not match the size of shoe Hart wore. Hart did not wear a nine and a half shoe. And there's also the fact that his fingerprint did not match the one found on the flashlight. He also supposedly had an ironclad alibi. Later, when analyzed, DNA evidence showed that three out of five probes matched Hart's DNA. Statistically, DNA from one in 7,700 Native Americans would obtain these results. And while the testing seemed to narrow down the perpetrator to potentially being of Native American descent, the most authorities could do, even in 2022, was say that DNA evidence strongly pointed towards Hart. During the trial, even with DNA evidence, accusations of Hart being framed began to circulate. However, 
even though he was acquitted of the crime, Hart would still be sent back to prison in order to serve the remainder of his original sentence which he had escaped from. This was 305 out of 308 years in prison. However, he would only go to serve two more of these years due to dying of a heart attack after lifting weights and excessive exercise. Eventually, the Girl Scouts sold the camp, which had opened in 1928. It was sold to a local family in the 1980s. Camp Scott remains closed to this day, and it is believed that the site has some amount of paranormal activity due to being frequented by ghost hunters along with paranormal enthusiasts who claim the three murdered girls currently haunt the area. Now we have to ask ourselves, if it wasn't Hart, then who could have committed the crime? Seeing as this became a cold case, which happened more than 40 years ago, and remains unsolved, it is unlikely that we will be able to move anything forward, barring some potential last minute discovery. However, even though it remains unsolved, and he was cleared of charges, the focus still remains placed on Hart. Add to that, that the investigators still aren't sure if they should have been looking for a single individual or a group leads to the unfortunate realization that it is unlikely that the case will ever be solved. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.